Peggy, thank you so much, and, and thanks to all of you for the privilege of being with you. So, so uh, Admiral Mr. Schneider, thank you. General Sullivan, one of my, my heroes here. Uh, General Todd, what a privilege it was to meet you tonight. Admiral Gilmore, one of our greatest allies uh, here from uh, Australia. And then, and then all fellow general officers, but really mainly cadets, faculty members, those who really make this great university work and, and, and make ROTC, this awesome, this awesome program, uh, work for, for not just our services, but for our nation uh, as well. So it's a privilege to be with you to celebrate the last 100 years, but then also to talk about really the next 100 years and what lies ahead, I think, for our nation and how ROTC will, will play a critical role to ensuring that our, our nation remains secure, that we are prepared to deter war, which is really what we want to do, right? But when that fails, to be able to fight and win uh, in future armed conflict and protect our fellow citizens. So as a cavalry officer, you know, I've long admired Norwich. I mean, it has a great cavalry tradition. And, uh, and Major General Ernest Harmon is my hero. I mean, he really is my hero. I, I, uh, and when I, when I first learned about General Harmon, I was about ready to, uh, to deploy to Desert Storm, Desert Shield at the time. And you know, my executive officer, our, our, our troop executive officer in E Troop of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment was cleaning out his, his office, you know, and, and the EXO's office has like a little bit of everything, you know, pretty scary, you know, smoke grenades, whatever, things that weren't supposed to be there. But, but it, it, behind one of the drawers, he pulls out this paper, and the title is Notes on Combat Actions in Tunisia and North Africa by, by General Ernest Harmon, written by General Harmon based on 2nd Armored Division's experience in World War II in North Africa to help all the other divisions prepare for the invasion of Normandy. You must read it. Every cadet, you, you have to read it. It's brilliant. It is, the, it is the best preparation for combat that our unit had. And we distilled out of that so many lessons. Fundamentally, it was the, the division will succeed only as the platoon succeeds. So all of you who are going to be lieutenants in any of our services, what that means is you're not apprentices. You're not novices. You're combat leaders. Everybody will look to you when things get tough in battle. So you have to be a leader in all things from day one. And so, but I, I could go on and on about, about his, uh, his many observations. You know, the most important thing you can do as a leader is put leaders in positions of leadership. And then he had great advice you know, just for, you know, how, how to fight. You know, one of, one of his axioms was if it takes a toothpick, use a baseball bat. Right? So, so uh, but, but I really recommend this paper to you. And so I grew fond of General Harmon, and, uh, and, and I, I read his memoir, Combat General. I took it with me uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to Iraq, and it, it got destroyed there. It was out of print, but a good friend of mine replaced it for me. Thank goodness. But, uh, but anyway, I, it's just such a privilege to be here as a cavalry officer. You can't help but, you know, but, but absorb you know, the cavalry spirit. And you had, you had General Milley here, right, uh, yesterday. And I should tell you, I mean, he, he, he should have told you himself, but I'll have, to, I'll have to let you in on this. He really wants to be a cavalry officer. He really does. He really, really does. And so, so he's very covetous of, of, uh, of the cavalry. As, as, I mean, you can't blame him, right? So, so, uh, so we, were, we fought together in South Baghdad. His, his brigade had been there for about eight months. We were just getting into the so-called Triangle of Death area of Mamadi Lutafia Yusufia. And that guy is a great combat commander. He was forward with his soldiers every day. And our regiment learned so much because they had already been there for eight months. And he didn't have tanks and aircraft and Bradleys, and we cut them to him. We didn't have infantry. He cut infantry to us, and we just got after the enemy together. But one day, we're, we had one of our meetings about how we, how we match up our, our capabilities together and how we get after the enemy. And he was, he was walking kind of awkwardly, you know, out of the, out of, out of, out of the regimental headquarters. And I said, Mark, what are you, what are you doing? You know, and he was stealing the saber of command. General Patton's saber from the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, he had stuffed it in his pants, you know. So, so, of course, I couldn't blame him. I said, I know you really do want to be cavalry, but give me the saber back, damn it. So, so, uh, so but he, what, what, a, what a great opportunity to hear from him, as, as always. And, and, uh, and so, but so many other Norwich graduates who I've come across, across my career, right? So, so uh, Second Lieutenant Michael Hamilton, I think he was probably class of 89, Brian, I think he was. Uh, he, his, 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 uh, he was a great hockey player here. His, we called him Bullwinkle because his head was not unlike a moose's rack. It was a very large <laughs> head. I mean, it was, we were concerned that we might, might not be able to find, you know, a, a combat vehicle crewman helmet to fit his head. 
Actually, the one that we did find, the largest one, it kind of was like a yarmulke on the back of his head. <laughs> Appropriate for Passover, but it was on the back of his head. And, uh, and, and, but what a great combat leader, a great combat Norwich leader. Brian, Brian Radliff, Brian, where are you? Raise your hand. Okay, awesome. Another one of my lieutenants, great. And then a major uh, with us in, in the 3rd Cavalry Regiment. Great combat leader, awesome, awesome combat leader. Scott Breckenridge, who all you know here at your ROTC department, where's Scott? My first, uh, my, my first company commander uh, as, as a tank platoon leader. And then one of our lieutenants stupidly said, hey, I think a lieutenant's like maybe an office, you know? And so, so <laughs> Breckenridge at the time, Captain Breckenridge reached behind him. He had one of these heavy, like, Samsonite, Samsonite briefcases. He said, lieutenants don't need, don't need it. an office. You need the front slope of your tank. And he hurled the Samsonite, the Samsonite uh, briefcase uh, at, one of the, uh, at one of my unfortunate colleagues who was able to deflect it, luckily, and survive the experience. But what I, learned, I learned so much from that guy. What a great, great leader. I could go on and on about Michael Krauss and, and, uh, and so, many, so many just great, great Norwich graduates who had a huge, a huge impact on me. But okay, last week, though, I was at Carnegie Mellon University. And I ran into one of your most recent graduates from the class of 2015. Her name is Second Lieutenant Maria Lavolsi, who is, who is in our Army's new cyber branch. And, and so I said, hey, I'm going to Norwich. I'm going to your old school. Let me know, let me know what you thought about the experience and, and everything. And so she wrote to me, and I think this says everything about RTC and about Norwich. She wrote, I can honestly say that going to Norwich has led me to where I am today. And I would not have the work ethic and motivation I have if it weren't for attending Norwich. Norwich makes you want to be the best you can be every day. And so, you know, we read, we read a lot today, right, about differences in generations, right, and millennials versus and everything. So I don't, buy, I don't buy into it because I think that there is a lot more continuity across generations, especially among those who volunteer to serve in our armed forces. And there are a lot more continuities and differences, I think, among these generations. Our military is a living historical community. And ROTC, one of the key things ROTC does, is it helps us to preserve the legacy of honor, courage, and selfless service that we have inherited from those who have gone before us. Some of those at this front table who are heroes of mine, heroes like, like, uh, like General Ernest Harmon. So when Captain Alden Partridge planted the seeds of ROTC when he founded what became Norwich University in 1819, his goal was to prepare citizen soldiers to defend our republic through a national system of education of professional and militia officers. Later in the 19th century, you know, angered in part by the defection of so many West Pointers, I hate to say that, uh, to, to the Confederacy during the Civil War, Congress included the requirement for military training in the Morrill Act of 1862. That's an established land-grant universities. So we expand. We see this, see this expanding of, of training citizens to become soldiers in, in the professional uh, armed forces and, and in the militia, or the full-time armed forces in the militia. In 1916, of course, General Leonard Wood, as he watched the carnage of the Great War in Europe from afar, he wanted to create a body, a body of reserve officers to enable the Army to expand should the United States be drawn into another war. The National Defense Act established ROTC as a formal program or to that war or subsequent wars. So that system for training and educating civilian volunteers to become leaders and warriors in our armed services is as vital to our nation's security today as it was throughout the 20th century, the century that was the bloodiest in human history. And that is because, that is because the stakes today are high. They're very high. Threats to national security and all humanity are increasing, and our military is shrinking. And so the need for ROTC is certain to grow. It is certain to grow because our nation will have to respond to those threats and is likely to struggle to develop the capabilities and regain the size and strength necessary to secure our nation. 
The stakes are high today because we are engaged, as previous generations were engaged, against enemies that pose a grave threat to all civilized peoples. We must defeat modern-day barbarians like Daesh and Al-Qaeda, who cynically use a perverted interpretation of religion to perpetuate ignorance, incite hatred, and commit the most heinous crimes against innocents. The stakes are high because battlegrounds overseas are inexorably connected to our own security. We see those connections as the Islamic State controls territory to plan and prepare for mass murder in France, Belgium, Lebanon, Turkey, Egypt, Iraq, and across the greater Middle East and Africa. We see connections as these terrorists entice masses of disaffected young people with a sophisticated campaign of propaganda, disinformation, and brainwashing. We see connections as terrorists, along with the brutal actions of the Assad regime, Iranian proxies, and Russian forces in Syria, cause the greatest mass migration and humanitarian catastrophe since World War II. And because the stakes are high today, as they were in the previous century, we need ROTC to do two fundamental things. Not only for our military, but also for American society. First, preserve our warrior ethos. And second, help warriors remain connected to their fellow citizens, those in whose name we fight and serve. So the warrior ethos is a covenant. It's a covenant between all of us in the military, comprised of values such as honor, duty, courage, loyalty, and self-sacrifice. But our warrior ethos also depends on our military's connection to our society. That is because when we in our military are valued by our fellow citizens, we value ourselves. Ultimately, it is the warrior ethos that permits servicemen and women to see themselves as part of a community that sustains itself through sacred trust and a covenant that binds them not only to one another, but also to our society and to our nation. The warrior ethos is important. It's important because it's what, it's what makes units effective in combat. It's also important because it what, it's what makes war less inhumane. We need ROTC more than ever because the warrior ethos is at risk. The warrior ethos is at risk because fewer and fewer Americans are connected to our professional military. The warrior ethos is at risk because fewer and fewer Americans understand what is even at stake in the wars in which we are engaged today. How many Americans could, for example, even name the three Taliban groups that we have been fighting in Afghanistan and Pakistan since 2001? The warrior ethos is at risk because some argue that victory over an enemy or winning in war is an old idea that is no longer relevant in today's complex world. The warrior ethos is at risk because some continue to advocate for simple, mainly technological solutions to the problem of future war, ignoring war's very nature as a human and political activity that is fundamentally a contest of wills. The warrior ethos is at risk because popular culture waters down and coarsens the warrior ethos. Warriors are most often portrayed as fragile, traumatized human beings. Hollywood tells us little about the warrior's calling or commitment to his or her fellow warriors. 
or what compels him or her to act courageously, endure hardships, take risks, or make sacrifices. So ROTC is indispensable today to help both future officers and our fellow citizens understand war and understand warriors. And we need ROTC more than ever to help keep our military connected to those in whose name we fight. And that's because in our democracy, if society is disconnected from an understanding of war or is unsympathetic to the warrior ethos, it will become increasingly difficult to maintain the fundamental requirements of military effectiveness and to recruit young men and women into the military service. So we might emphasize above all to our cadets and to our citizens that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen are both warriors and humanitarians. They are warriors and humanitarians because they fight in places like Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq against those who commit mass murder and genocide, torture and enslave, rape, and commit the worst kinds of child abuse. They are warriors and humanitarians because they defend our children and our way of life on modern day frontiers between barbarism and civilization. So what might the ROTC curriculum emphasize in the next 100 years to preserve our warrior ethos and help our military stay connected to our society? The opportunity to study war and warfare and warriors across the curriculum, not just in ROTC programs, holds promise for enabling cross-discipline, interactive, reflective learning in a way that accomplishes both objectives. Historical experience and military history in particular is an ideal vehicle, not only for preserving the warrior ethos and connecting warriors and citizens, but also for enriching and connecting military instruction with the study of other disciplines, other disciplines such as philosophy, theology, and law, with an emphasis on applied ethics, as General Combs already mentioned, just war theory, military honor, and stoicism, and what that means to the warrior ethos and to our professional ethic. Language, geography, and area studies, as General Combs already mentioned as well, to understand and develop empathy, empathy for the cultures and historical experience of the peoples among whom wars are fought. Literature, literature to reflect on examples of positive and negative leadership, as well as the human experience and morality and immorality of war. Leadership, to understand the importance of setting the example, to, to determining a vision, team building, keeping soldiers informed, and managing combat stress. Math, science, and engineering, to consider technological and scientific change in context, though, of human, political, cultural, and psychological continuities in war. Physiolo physiology and psychology, to understand how to improve human and team strength, performance, and resilience. So encouraging universities to offer and cadets to pursue an interdisciplinary approach to the study of war will help integrate academic, military and physical development to produce leaders of character who possess the intellect and the determination to win, to win against these enemies we're facing and to win in this complex world. And it would provide an opportunity for future military leaders and fellow students to discuss what they might expect from each other. Those discussions might provide a corrective to the tendency in our country to confuse military studies with militarism. As the English theologian, writer, and philosopher G.K. Chesterton observed, war is not the best way of settling differences, but it is the only way 
of preventing them from being settled for you. And as George Washington once observed, to be prepared for war is the most effectual means to promote peace. So we ought to study war in a way that's analogous to, to what Raymond Bradbury was trying to do in the great novel Fahrenheit 451. When he was interviewed, an interviewer said, are you trying to predict the future? He said, hell no, I'm trying to prevent it. And so the study of war is important to the preservation of peace. So those discussions could promote moral conduct by generating empathy for others, as General Combs already said, in an effort to prevent war, or at least make war less inhumane. As a Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius observed, respect becomes concrete through empathy. Empathy developed through the study of war is important not only to the development of military leaders who are both warriors and humanitarians, but also to the preservation of our identity and strength as a nation. Those discussions between young men and women in our universities could help young cadets and young students understand and respect their roles, their roles as warriors, humanitarians, and citizens. Those discussions about the study of war and warfare from an interdisciplinary perspective will provide future officers not only with a strong understanding of their profession, but also a solid foundation for further education and self-development. The goal should be to spark intellectual curiosity it would be consistent with Clausewitz said about military theory. It's not to accompany you to the battlefield to make your decisions for you, but it's, it's just as, as, a, as a wise teacher guides a student in their self-education, that your knowledge of war uh, ought to, is not to lead you by the hand, but to allow you to deal with complex situations, ask the right questions, and to learn across a career of service. So ROTC graduates you don't have to be experts. But RTC graduates must know enough to be humble and sensitive to the limits of reasoning by historical analogy, but also confident, confident enough to continue learning and to be engaged on contemporary issues of national security. So unless future officers study war and warriors, lessons from even our most recent military experiences will, in the words of the great historian Carl Becker, lay inert in unread books. That would not only be regrettable, it would be dangerous. Dangerous to the national interest and dangerous to those who do the fighting. Humanity needs American warriors now more than ever. The stakes are high, but we should be confident. Confident because ROTC and the universities like this great university that host ROTC will continue to develop young men and women who are warriors and humanitarians. Confident because ROTC will help keep our servicemen and women connected to their fellow citizens. So to, to cadets here this evening and ROTC leaders and the faculty and staff who are training and educating our next generation of Army leaders, thank you for your service to our nation and humanity. And thank you for the great privilege of being with you to celebrate this awesome anniversary. Thank you very much. General, I can't think of a better way to wrap this up, but he's willing to take questions for a few minutes, maybe 10 or so. There's one mic tonight. This is a small, intimate wardroom or mess tent party. So, would you like to? Anyone like to step up to the mic? Good evening, sir. I'm Cadet Walbridge. I'm junior here in the Corps of Cadets, and I'll hopefully be commissioning in the United States Air Force next year. I also work for Google as a part-time job as a student ambassador for a university on their tech side of everything. And one thing Google teaches us is that it is okay to fail, as long as you pick yourself up and learn from that. What would you, what words of wisdom would you be able to give all of us, both cadets, adults, professionals, even fellow generals, 
that other people would consider your biggest failure or one of your biggest failures, but that you saw as a learning experience, that you picked yourself up and continue to move on? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, you know, the older you get, the better you were. You know what I mean? So it's hard to come up with one thing. So you look back in retrospect, you know, but uh, gosh, I'm sure there are a lot of failures in, in, in my career, but I was very fortunate to grow up in an environment where, uh, where, where leaders underwrote mistakes and encouraged you to, to make mistakes of omission. So in the cavalry, our culture is that the only mistake you can make is to say you're waiting for orders, right? And then leaders underwrite the, the mistakes of, of, of leaders if, uh, if they're taking risks to, you know, to try to maintain the initiative over the enemy and so forth. You know, we, we actually, I think, uh, ought to really push the limits of our capabilities and to recognize that good units occasionally fail because they do push the units of their, the limits of their capabilities so they can get better in training and not have to pay the cost in, in blood, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the future. But, uh, gosh, I mean, I'm, you know, there are probably hundreds of, of failures I could tell you about in, in my career, but not one that's really, that I can think of as worthy of an object lesson at this moment. But uh, great question. Great. Next. Good evening, sir. My name is Liam Carroll. I'm a junior cadet here at Norwich. Um, a little louder, Liam, please. Oh, excuse me. I'm a junior cadet here at Norwich. Uh, I was wondering uh, what you think the biggest threat is facing our Army today. Okay. Um, I think the biggest threat facing our Army today, uh, in terms of external threats, you know, it's very hard to predict, obviously, where the next war is going to be. But we're already at war uh, against a resurgent Taliban uh, that, that, are, that, are, that have regenerated and continue to regenerate. Uh, across the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And of course the stakes are, are high there for the nation, uh, but also for our, our soldiers who are fighting there alongside Afghan uh, soldiers. Uh, because it, it, it could, you could be faced with the prospect of the return of a safe haven and support base or a, a, uh, a, a, a weak and criminalized narcotic state that could fund transnational terrorist organizations who already want to kill our children. The stakes are extremely high in the greater Middle East with the establishment of a terrorist proto-state in the greater Middle East. Uh, and, and, uh, and this humanitarian catastrophe I mentioned, but also this very destructive civil war between the Sunni and, Sunni and Shia Arab populations there. It's even more complicated than that, obviously, when you, when you throw in the ethnic aspects of the conflict. And then, of course, Russia's intervention with, I think, what you might call an, an axis uh, of, of Russia, Iran, uh, and, um, uh, and, and the Assad regime. Um, I think what Iran is trying to do is apply the Hezbollah model to the to the Middle East broadly, where they have weak governments in power that are dependent on the Iranians for support, where they grow militias and, and other groups that can be turned against those governments if, they, if those governments take action against Iranian interests. It's a situation in Iraq, you know, where the Iraqi government and security forces are, are in large measure subverted and infiltrated by, by uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and their proxies. Uh, you, the, the pressure that, that uh, President Haider al is under right now is really that begins with Iran. Uh, who, who was raising that the problem set uh, and really, in effect, trying to besiege him uh, through the Sutterists and so forth. And then we have, uh, but we have problems from other nation states as well. And I think that the prospect for, for great power conflict or for a major international military crisis is larger today than it has been since after World War II. And the reason is you have revisionist powers that are, that are surrounded by, by weak states uh, that are taking aggressive action and are trying to remake, I think, the, 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 uh, the global political, economic, and security order uh, in a way that, that is at disadvantage to, to U.S. interests and, and, and to, to reorder those arrangements in favor of their interests. And that's Russia, China, uh, and then, of course, it's hard to understate the problem of, of, uh, associated with North Korea and the danger. To the Army itself, to the Army itself, I think we are, we're facing uh, kind of a triple whammy, as, as one report called it recently where we have a very significant drawdown in the size of the force, I think way too small. You know, I think that an active army of 450, based on what's going on in the world, is too, is too small to secure a nation, total force of 980,000. And, uh, and, and so army forces are increasingly committed, which means fewer and fewer land forces are available to surge to contingency operations. And if you combine that, that large drawdown in the number of, of size of the force with the, the, uh, the huge cut in the modernization budget, 1 50th of the procurement budget in the Department of Defense is for land systems. But that's, I mean, that's where we're fighting today. And so our enemies who have been studying us very carefully since the Gulf War have been adapting and improving their militaries 
and, and, uh, and we have not modernized uh, really to fight those kind of enemies. And so we're, we're, our budget is down when the need to modernize, to stay ahead is, is very great. So, so what we would do about that? Well, in a democracy, you get the army that the American people are willing to pay for, right? And it's our job as, as general officers and leaders to do the best you can with the, what you've got. So we're, our chief has prioritized readiness first. And what we need to do is, I think, make a sustained case to our leaders and to the American public on why you know, their sons and daughters in the Army need the benefit of probably some additional sources and, and more, uh, more men and women standing next to them so we have sufficient depth and capacity in the force. Uh, just a small part, too, sir. Just given the current circumstances, what do you think we can do on the company and platoon level to, uh, to affect this? Well, I mean, the mission is simple in platoons and companies. Make your piece of the Army the best it can be, right? And you can do that even with limited resources. And so the, the key is to make sure that you ask yourself every day, if we were to go to combat tomorrow, if we were in battle tomorrow, what would we most wish we had trained on? And so, you know, develop in that, in that unit a commitment to excellence, where excellence is self-sustaining. You know, build into your training what happens in combat, bad information, casualties, rush things from time to time. Challenge your unit. Challenge your young men and women. They're, 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 they're soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardmen. They expect the military to be hard. They're disappointed when it's not, right? Challenge them. And what you'll, be, what you'll see is a really cohesive team come together. And it's tremendously rewarding. I mean, being a, being a lieutenant and a captain, it is, the, it is the best job in our military. Because what happens is you're part of an organization where the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you. Where else is that replicated? Anywhere. And what you'll see is you'll see that team become a family. And they are bound together by that sacred trust and confidence and respect. And, uh, and, and, and you can foster that with, through your leadership. Thank you, sir. Sir, Cadet Michael Carrera, senior here in the Army ROTC program. Now, you'd mentioned modernization, and you uh, obviously we have many enemies that are very in the spotlight right now, such as ISIL or other uh, organizations that cause a lot of uh, loud noise on the news, we'll say. Do you believe we have any more silent enemies that are also modernizing their militaries at this point in time? Any more what, I'm sorry? Any more, uh, I say silent enemies, but anyone that's kind of hiding in the back, modernizing along with us that could potentially become a threat to the young leaders. Yeah, I mean, they're not really hiding, right? And so you know, uh, Russia and China, for example, you know, I think are engaged in, a, in, a, in a, an activity that two, two uh, authors in a recent book called The Unquiet Frontier, this is Wes Mitchell and Jakob Griegel, I recommend the book. They, 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 have, they have sort of categorized the strategic behavior that they're engaged in as probing, which is really trying to, uh, to challenge U.S. interests at the far reaches of American power and, um, and, to, and to create, you know, use really a sophisticated campaign that's not just military action, but it's really unconventional forces under the cover of conventional forces, a sophisticated propaganda you know, campaign, and an effort to sow dissent among, among uh, partners and, and allies. And I think you see this with, uh, you know, with what Russia has put on display in terms of capabilities in Syria, but before that with the, really the, beginning with the, the invasion of, uh, of Georgia in 2008, the annexation of Crimea, and then the invasion of Ukraine. And so a lot of those capabilities are on display, and I think it's been a bit of a wake-up call for us. Uh, those involve, you know, like mass artillery fires that are tied to unmanned aerial systems, sophisticated uh, cyber electromagnetic capabilities to disrupt our network systems. Uh, you see uh, advanced combat vehicles with active protective systems improve lethality in, in, in their, in their anti-tank weapons, you know, for example. So uh, I think we, we have learned quite a bit about that already, and, uh, and, and we're, we're shifting some priorities to, to make sure that we can maintain overmatch uh, over what are increasingly capable enemies. Enemies that, did, that have not remained static, you know, who've been watching us and are, are trying to improve. I think the one thing, the key thing, I think there are four implications for defense strategy right now based on what we've seen from Russia. The first implication is allies are more important than ever, right? And so this is a return of geopolitical theory of the, of the late eight, uh, 19th and early 20th centuries, Thomas Mackinder. These conflicts are, cap are occurring in shatter zones on the borders of revisionist powers that are trying to remake the world in a way that is more, that is more amenable or, and, and sympathetic to their interests. It's a very dangerous time uh, as, as, a, as a result of that. So allies are very important. The second thing is that American military power is joint power. You need synergy between air, land, and sea forces. I think we have this tendency to invest in high technology, mainly in maritime aerospace forces, 
and neglect land forces, even when I think it's quite apparent that we need we need all capabilities, right? So, so uh, I just point out that all the conflicts that we see occurring are about the control of territory, and that ISIL doesn't have a navy or an air force, and they're doing okay. So, what you need is you need the synergistic effect of capable air, maritime, cyberspace, and and, and land forces. The, th the third, I think, uh, implication, you know, for us is that we have to really resurrect deterrence, deterrence theory. Uh, we have, I think, bought into this idea that we can deter these powers through the threat of punitive action later, rather than ter deterrence by denial. You know, and, and that means convincing your enemy that your enemy cannot accomplish their objectives. And so I think this argues for the forward positioning of forces along these frontiers where you have forces like Russia or countries like Russia that are waging limited war for limited objectives. Think about what Russia did in Ukraine. They, they invaded Ukraine at zero cost to them, consolidated gains over that territory, and then portrayed the response as escalatory. And so the only way really to, to deter a force that's waging limited war for limited objectives is to ratchet up the cost at the frontier, like we did with the force that, we, that has remained in Korea since 1953. Thank you very much, sir. This is the last question. Good evening, sir. Cadet Eric Mentes, Senior Air Force Cadet here. Earlier at the panel, General Perkins talked about self-development, and he said, he said you were the go-to guy and you had more information on this. Uh, and that sparked my curiosity, so I was hoping you could elaborate on self-development. If there's a formula or ways to promote yeah. someone to try and improve each day. Okay. I would say that, I mean, the key to it is, I think, it's read military history, think about it, and discuss it. And then read it purposefully, read the good, read really the, the good books that are going to help you understand better the experiences of those who have gone before you, right? Think about how arrogant it would be if we all said, hey, you know, I'm going to lead young men and women into combat, but all I need to know to do that effectively is my own personal experience, right? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, you have to learn from others, right, to inform, to inform your, your judgment. And so I think the key thing is to, is to read and to read in a focused way. Um, there's an, a resource available on the Fort Benning webpage. If you go to the Fort Benning webpage and go to Leader Development, it's called the Maneuver Leader Self-Study Program. And in, the, in that program, there's, there's an introduction for each topic. So one, one of this, how to use history to understand your profession and your responsibilities, that's one of the topics. Another topic is moral, ethical, and psychological preparation of soldiers and teams for combat to operate in environments of persistent danger and uncertainty. How do you preserve the moral character of a unit in those difficult circumstances? So, so those are just examples of the topics. Then what you, there, in, there's a discussion of what the topic is, why it's important to leaders, and then a suggestion about how to go about studying it with like a reading list. And what you should, I think the way to do it is to read you know, a good book with an article that kind of synthesizes the topic, and then, then look at films and have a discussion. The social aspect of it is really key. And you can form a study group, you know, just using Facebook or something. You can pick the book, read it, you know, discuss, even it, for those of you who are graduating, you stay in contact with each other and, and do that. And if you're ever reading like a really boring book and it's boring, you just bag it. Move on to another book, right? I mean, just don't, I mean, find the books that interest you and, the, and, 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 that, uh, and that you can, you, you think you can learn from and you're excited about and, and read those. 